You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Stephanie Robel. Authors, I have a fantastic new service to tell you about. It's called PubSite. PubSite is a service to help you build your very own website, your home on the web, where you can promote your work and give your fans a place to connect with you. PubSite is a website platform that allows every author, regardless of budget, to have a great-looking professional website developed by the book marketing professionals at FSB Associates. PubSite is the new easy-to-use DIY website builder developed specifically for books and authors. Whether you're an author of one book or 20 or a small publisher, PubSite allows you to build, design, and most importantly, update your website pain-free. No need to be dependent on a designer or webmaster to make a small but costly change to your website. Save the money and do it yourself. PubSite is the best platform for authors because it's a book-centric platform. PubSite was built just for authors and small publishers. Every design, feature, and layout is book-centric. They have customized designs for you to use. It's easy to build. No coding or HTML is necessary to create a stunning, professional-looking website with all the features you want. Get a custom domain name, yourname.com. It's simple to update. You can add all of your books, add a blog and a book tour, sell from any retailer, manage your email list and social media, and even do e-commerce. Build your website with a 14-day free trial, then pay just $19.99 per month, which includes hosting. And we offer packages starting at $499 to set up the website for you. Pub-Site.com, the place to help authors find their home on the web. The Feisty Heroin Romance Collection of Short Stories. Over 30-plus pulse-racing shorts to capture your heart with USA Today, The Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and award-winning authors in the mix. Paranormal, contemporary, fantasy, and historical romance that will whet your appetite with titillating, heart-pounding tales you'll want to read again, then beg for more. Fall in love with your next book crush. Pre-order this amazing collection of shorts, over 30 pulse-pounding stories for only 99 cents. Proceed with caution. Buying this collection may lead to addictive reading, falling in love with your next book crush, and staying up past your bedtime to see what happens next. Get your limited edition copy of Feisty Heroines. Look for the link in the show notes of this episode. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Thank you so much for uh, joining me today. My guest is Stephanie Robel. Uh, Stephanie has an amazing debut novel. Uh, you guys know how much I love thrillers and, uh, and psychological uh, crime mysteries, and I'll tell you what, when this book came across my desk, it uh, it got me all giddy inside for all the wrong reasons. Um, this is this is such an amazing book. It's called Darling Rose Gold, and uh, I can't wait to talk about it today. Welcome to the show, Stephanie. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining me. Uh, Stephanie, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Ooh, that's a good one. Uh, I guess I, this isn't, I don't even know if it's a memory, but there is a physical copy of it. So I know it happened. I wrote this story when I was five in kindergarten and it was probably, I don't know, six or seven pages. And I had all these old school graphics and images to go with it as well. And it was called how Marianne got lost at the zoo. Uh, a much happier ending, I would say, than the kinds of stuff that I'm writing now. But yeah, that was my first foray into writing. Oh, that's so funny. Uh, were you a bookish kid? Did you read a lot? Yes, I constantly had a book in my hands. Nice. Uh, do you remember what the, the first uh, book or series or author it was that just captured your imagination and took you to a different world? 
I can remember going through the Babysitter's Club just at a rapid, rapid pace. And I also loved, there was this series on horses called Thoroughbred. And then there was also, you know, the Nancy Drew series, which really captured my heart and I guess has catapulted me into where I am today. Oh, those those early mystery books, Nancy Drew, Hardy Boys, yeah, uh, e- even Encyclopedia Brown, uh, th- those have been gateway drugs to so many uh, you know, thriller and mystery writers. Uh, I, I love seeing that there's a whole generation uh, of writers out there who are influenced by those. They're amazing books. And I'm now having written just one, I'm amazed that these authors can just keep chugging out book after book after book. It's quite a feat. I know, I know. Um, do you remember what the first mystery was that that opened you up to the genre uh, and that, uh, you know, kind of twisted your brain? Oh, I don't have a great memory, so I don't know about the first, but I will say one that made a really lasting impact was Gone Girl, which I know, you know, every mystery writer oh, probably yeah. has in their arsenal. But I think for me, you know, the, the, the two timelines, the two POVs and just this deep psychological examination really stuck with me. And I've studied that book over and over just to deconstruct it and see how it works. And I think it's a great tool for any suspense writer. Right. Um, I, I know that uh, that you pursued an MFA uh, and that Darling Rose Gold is, is actually um, a product of that MFA experience. Is that right? Yes, it was my thesis for my MFA. What uh, what led you to the MFA route? Well, I've always been a really structured thinker and I I perform best when I have sort of a plan set ahead of me. And so I had been working in advertising for seven or eight years and I was between freelance jobs and I kind of felt like I didn't have as much to lose at that point. And so I thought, you know, what's the fastest way that I can improve at fiction writing as much as possible? And I thought, you know what, I'm going to give an MFA a try and see how that works out. Now, you actually um, worked in advertising, is that right? Yes, as a copywriter. I, I am fascinated by um, advertising as uh, you know, as an industry and, and people that work in that, uh, because you're, that's, that's kind of some of the, I don't want to say purest storytelling, but you, your whole job is to try to connect with people emotionally, um, you know, whether you're, you're trying to sell something to them or... Um, you're trying to connect with that person and and to to connect with them in a way that moves them to action. Um, how do you feel like your time as a copywriter in advertising has helped you as a fiction writer? And do you see those skill sets as being complementary? Yes, I definitely see them as complementary. And I think, you know, of course, there's you're kind of rooting around in human psychology and behavior for both. But I think from a more craft level perspective, um, just the ability to edit and to be concise and to tighten the sentences. Um, when you have only a few words to fill up a billboard, you know, you really have to choose those words carefully. And I think those lessons have really uh, come across to my novel writing. For sure. Um, so you're you're working in uh, in advertising and, and there's a there's a gap uh, in the work. Um, what did you expect from uh, the MFA pro- program, and did it live up to your expectations? Well, my, <laughs> I, figured, I figured my worst case scenario was I would at least get a graduate degree out of this book, and this has surpassed my best case scenario, which was, you know, maybe get an agent, maybe get a publishing deal, but this has been just absolutely tremendous. So yes, for me, the MFA route was absolutely pivotal. I think you know, I don't think it's necessary that writers have to go that route, but I think for me, it just expedited the progress I would have made, right? So I could have done this on my own, but I think something that took two years probably would have taken, I don't know, like five or eight or 10 or however long. It's just, you have access to qualified instructors and writers, which personally, I didn't know any writers before I went to the MFA. So I got a lot out of it. What uh, what was one of the first things that you learned uh, as a fiction writer um, that that maybe surprised you? Um, I think I guess so. So part of the MFA program, I guess a big part of it is to do these workshops and you're workshopping short stories. And one of the biggest surprises was just how much this sounds ridiculous, but like how much has already been done and that it's actually really difficult to tell 
kind of the same story in a fresh way, right? So there's the, the same stories are told over and over and over, you, you know, whether they're romance or suspense or whatever. But to try to find that unique thing that makes it yours, I think was a pivotal lesson to learn, but not as straightforward and easy as one might think. Gotcha. Um, so at what point in the process did, uh, did Darling Rose Gold uh, kind of come into your imagination? So I was actually brainstorming ideas for a screenwriting class that I was taking, and I ended up doing something else for the for the screenplay that I was writing. But that idea just kind of sat with me. And what you know, I first found out about Munchausen by proxy from my best friend, who's an elementary school psychologist in Colorado, and she told me about it. And I was horrified and riveted, and I went and did my own research, and I was shocked to discover that the perpetrators are often women and mothers. And, you know, we think of the mother-child bond as sacred, but it's not in these cases. And I wanted to explore why that was. Did Had you ever heard of Munchausen syndrome by proxy before that? Not before my friend told me about it, no. Gotcha. That uh, I remember the first time I heard about it. It was maybe on a one of those news uh, magazine shows like 2020 or Dateline mm. NBC or something like that. And mm -hmm. I was absolutely floored. Um, by the entire concept of it, you know, that someone, and for those of you that, that don't know, this is when, when a caretaker, usually a parent, um, does something to the person they're in care of, usually a child, uh, to, to keep them sick so that they can continue to get sympathy and care and, you know, whatever it is that they're, you know, feel like that they're needing from that situation. And it's, uh, it, it's a really warped uh, sense of the the typical caretaker um, situation. When when you first discovered this, um, what what was your first reaction when you uh, when you heard about this? Oh, horror! Probably like yeah. everyone else's. You know, it's just a horrific illness. And I think though, peeling it back and starting to look closer at it, I was most intrigued by the why, you know, I was just like, why do people do this? And who are the people that do this? And so that really was what set the story in motion is I wanted to know, do these mothers know that they're lying? Or do they think they're honestly doing what's best for their kids? And that was how Patty, the mother of my story came to be. So when, um, when you so you, your friend tells you about this and do you immediately start um, because you know how writers are, you hear something and all of a sudden a character shows up in your head and you're mm -hmm. like, oh, this is this is who this is. Um, it, it, is that the way it was? Did, did Patty just kind of walk onto the stage and, and start telling you about her sickness? I think for me, it's more like I find a situation very interesting and I start to do digging and research and it's like I can't let it go. And that, that's how I felt about this illness. And so once I really started to think about it and think I could write a story about a mother and daughter who are trying to get through this sort of thing, like that was when Patty came. And yes, once she once I thought about it, I feel like she came not fully formed, but certainly like she came to me like very quickly and much faster than Rose Gold's character. That was going to be my next ex uh, question was, was, um, um, was Patty connected to Rose Gold in the beginning or did, did Rose Gold have to kind of develop out of, uh, you discovering Patty? No, Patty was definitely the first, even though, you know, Rose Gold is the titular character. It was really Patty who drew me into it. And, but I just kind of realized, you know, she's an, such an unreliable narrator. I was like, we need somebody else to counter her experience of what's going on. And who better than the daughter or the, you know, the survivor to, to be that person. Right. Um, so in, in discovering Rose Gold, um, what, uh, what kind of research did you do to kind of uncover who this person uh, who might be the victim is? Because uh, I think the you know, the perpetrator gets a lot of the attention in these type situations. But the the victim, uh, you know, is, is the one in this case being poisoned and uh, almost gets gets looked over, uh, you know, in, in our pursuit of justice. 
Yeah, so I was able to read a memoir that was um, written by a survivor and then as well as some news accounts. And then on the more clinical side, I read a medical textbook on Munchausen by proxy and different variations of the illness. And so all of those things really helped to paint a general profile of both victims and perpetrators. And then from there, I kind of fleshed them out and made them into my own characters. Gotcha. Um e- some of your uh, you said Gillian Flynn was an early influence, uh, you know, with Gone Girl and and how that book really opened your mind to the possibilities of psychological thrillers. Um, were you drawing on some of those inspirations when you started fleshing out the story? Yes, I think maybe not specifically on Gone Girl, but I, you know, I think um, Shirley Jackson is an author who I've been a long time fan of. I love everything that she writes. It's just so creepy, but also thought provoking. And what's coming to mind specifically right now is um, we have always lived in the castle, which I don't know if you're familiar, but it's the story of the these two sisters who are just like stuck in their own property. And they this town has just like they do not like them and they do not want to have anything to do with them. And so that was really kind of going through my mind as I was flushing out my own town of Deadwick, which is, you know, just wants Patty gone. They will do whatever it takes to drive her out. And that feeling of being an outsider, I think, you know, it's already hard enough, I would imagine, to start over when you've been in prison or been away for a long time. But to have, you know, and everyone around you hating you and not giving you a chance would just really stack the deck against you. Right. Um, you, you currently live in England, don't you? Yes, in London. Yeah, but uh, but the book is set in Illinois. Yes, I'm from Chicago, from the suburbs of Chicago. Gotcha. Was that ever a um, uh, a thought of yours as to whether uh, you should set it in a familiar place, you know, like where you grew up, or um, you know, a, a more exotic locale like London, where you're living now? I think as a writer, you know, I'm happy to take on topics that I don't know. You know, obviously I have no experience with Munchausen by proxy in real life, but I think, you know, to have your story populated by another culture is a little bit trickier. And so although I've lived here for four years, I would hesitate to, at this point in my writing career and my expat career, I guess, to have a main character who's British or, you know, to have the story set here. I kind of wanted it closer to home so that you know, things like pop culture and colloquialisms and all of that play such an important role in Rose Gold's development that I wanted to make sure that I was set in a culture where I actually have a firm grasp of those things. Gotcha. Um, when you when you start learning about Munchausen syndrome by proxy and you're doing some research, um, did you find real life cases that help to inform, uh, you know, these characters and the um, uh, the, the story that they're living? Yes. And that was, you know, that was really helpful in forming the medical history because it can run quite the gamut, but there are a few overlapping, you know, syndromes or symptoms, I guess. Um, You know, feeding tubes are pretty common. Seizures can be common, um, malnutrition and that kind of stuff. So I wanted to look at quite an array just to see, you know, well, what is the, if there is a norm, like what is the norm so that my story was more realistic. Right. Um, what were some of the shocking, more shocking aspects of this illness that you learned about? Oh, it's been, you know, what's been horrifying is the number of people since I've started talking about this book is the number of people who said, I know someone who knows someone who has this illness. And, you know, I've, I've heard about mothers injecting pond water into their kids. Yeah, it's, I mean, this is not the, for the uh, faint of heart portion of the, of the podcast. But there was also a story I read in this memoir called Sickened uh, by Julie Gregory. And she describes coming home from the doctor with her mom in the car. And her mom says, you are such a good girl, a good girl today. You deserve a treat here. Have a sucker. And she turns and hands her a match. And Julie doesn't know any better. And so she eats the match and has no idea it's one of the things that's making her sick. And that image of a child sucking on a match has haunted me for years and has really stuck with me. Oh, wow. That is, uh, yeah. um, you know, parent and, and child relationships can be complicated, uh, as it is. I, I have sons and daughters, um, you know, sons and fathers, uh, you know, there, there's always this part of life and of adolescence where you're, um, setting out on your own and, and making your own way. Uh, and you know, the kids don't, uh, um, want to be told what to do. They want to find their own way. And then there's always, you know, parents who can 
be a little overbearing because they've seen these things and they want to steer them in the right direction. And, and all those things are, are kind of healthy parts of the parenting dynamic and the, the, the push and the pull, the give and the take and the, uh, you know, the boundaries between letting them uh, discover things and, and get hurt a little bit along the way, as opposed to, um, you know, just removing all barriers. Uh, and then the mother daughter relationship um, is, you know, can be a little contentious. Uh, as well. Uh, but this is a completely different dynamic between mother and daughter. How does this kind of warped uh, view of of that differ from what a normal relationship should be? Well, I mean, for one, most mothers hopefully aren't poisoning their daughters. So that's one start. But I think, you know, what I tried to do is start in a place that is more universal and relatable. So, you know, teenagers wanting independence from their parents and at the same time wanting approval. And then on the flip side, parents wanting to be appreciated and to be needed. Um, and so I started there, which I think is a more relatable impulse in most parents, and then just dramatized it and took it a step further. Well, how does a young woman who's been so dependent, more dependent than the average child on her mother for her entire life, find her independence? And it's just really interesting to examine that sort of complex relationship between a mother and daughter. The the narrative style that you chose for this book is, is really interesting and one that uh, is intriguing right, right out of the gate um, because like most um, thrillers and, and psychological suspense books, we are building toward um, this, this ultimate crime. Uh, sometimes at the, at the end in kind of a crescendo of the book, sometimes it's kind of midpoint where we're building up to something. And then the rest of the book, we're, we're trying to unravel why this happened. Um, you come right out of the gate and, uh, and hit us with it, uh, you know, in, at the beginning of the book, uh, why did you choose to tell the story in, in that fashion? Well, I think the part of the story I was the most interested in is Patty's motivation and why she does the things she does. So in order to examine that, I think you have to tell the reader up front, you know, this is what I've been accused of and convicted of and kind of unfold things from there. Um, I've always been, I think, you know, I love whodunits as well, but as far as my own writing, the why done it is what fascinates me the most. Yeah. Um, did you know how the book was going to end uh, from the beginning? Yes. So I, I should I should caveat that I wrote a first draft that was these same two main characters, but a, a different premise. And I ended up trashing that. But after I got to the second draft and started over, yes, from that point, I knew how I wanted it to end. Um, in the um, in the telling of the story, did uh, did any of the characters change? Uh, well, I, I guess I guess they did because you, you said they were originally a completely different story. Yeah, so I think, I mean, the, the most difficult part as far as character development went was Rose Gold because, you know, she goes through such a dynamic change throughout the story. And in earlier drafts, you know, she would be too much of a pushover throughout or then she'd be like too rebellious and sort of uh, hardened throughout. And so it was this con constant balancing act of trying to figure out where she would be as she goes through these different experiences in life. One thing that I was not um, prepared for when, uh, you know, when you sit down to read a book about Munchausen syndrome by proxy um, is the way that um, that I began to care um, about uh, the abuser and, and not in a not in a way that that you excused her behavior uh, or anything like that. But uh, but I began to feel compassion. Uh, for her, this is obviously someone who's not well. Um, you know, talk a little bit about um, uh, that process and how you came to care about the characters uh, in a way that you could believably tell their story. Well, that was my my one goal with the book is to again not certainly not condone Patty's behavior and maybe not even sympathize with her. But if we can empathize with her for a chapter or a paragraph or a sentence, then I think that's my job as the writer, because I, you know, I think if you're going to create a character and certainly if it's one of your main characters, your job is not to judge them, but to understand them. And 
with Patty, I just, I did what I think she would do and what other people with this illness would do, which is to minimize the horrible things that they're doing and instead focus on the things that, you know, they feel they're doing well. Um, and so, yeah, she, she thinks she's the hero of the story as does everyone. Everyone thinks they're the hero of their own story. And I just tried to focus on that. Um, are you an, an outliner or, um, are you a discovery writer? Did, did you lay out a map for this book? Um, you know, in, in the writing and, and follow that, or were you just kind of living through the story as you wrote it? I'm a pretty big outliner. Again, they just very structured and sort of organized thinker, but I, you know, I always, of course, allow for myself to veer away from the plan, but I think the outline for me is more of a safety blanket. You know, it's just kind of, it's overwhelming to have to write 90,000 words. And so I think if I, if I have a sentence of what each chapter is supposed to be, that takes away some of the pressure and just allows me to really focus on the sentences. Is that something that was encouraged um, in, in your MFA, the, uh, you know, the idea of outlining uh, or it, it, you know, was the program you attended just kind of tool agnostic, you, you, you know, um, outline or not, however you do it, this is the best way to do it. It was pretty tool agnostic, I would say. I think the program was less concerned. It wasn't so much of a how-to as a let's all bring the material we have and talk about how to improve it. Um, I think in general it feels like, and maybe this is just because I'm a boring outliner, but it feels like it's more romanticized to just kind of go by the seat of your pants and let the words take you where they will. But I wouldn't say one over the other was encouraged at the program. Gotcha. Um, since you're you're writing this in in the context of an MFA group, and um, were you were you bringing pieces of it to your writing group and sharing it with others along the way? Yeah, so I would workshop it in class. I think the farthest I got was maybe chapter four or five, because okay. again, you know, MFA programs are really set up structured more for short stories, so you could only bring, let's say, twenty twenty five pages in in a class. Um, so for class time stuff, it was, yeah, the first four or five chapters, but then I was very lucky to work with my mentor and thesis advisor, and she worked with me on every single chapter through the, you know, through the end of the book. At what point did you realize that you had something special? Um, when I started to get agent interest, <laughs> when I had, a, <laughs> when I had multiple agents um, wanting to talk and offering representation, that was the first time I was like, oh my gosh, you know, before that I was submitting my short stories to literary magazines. And I had accrued 221 rejections, not an exaggeration. Uh, and so, yeah, at that point, it was just kind of like, all right, well, I'm, you know, I'm paying my dues, I'm doing the apprenticeship thing. And then, you know, this just really took off in a way I completely did not see coming. Right. Well, you've, uh, you're kind of on the other side of that process. Now we've got uh, a book that is uh, out in the world, and people are loving it. So, you know, the early reviews are amazing. And that's got to be a good feeling. Uh, are you are you working on a follow up now? Yes. So I'm working on my second novel, and it's about a wellness center that has some cult like tendencies. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's usually the reaction I get. If there's one thing it. I've learned, it's that people are fascinated by cults. Um, but it's written from three points of view: from the leader, a member, and the member's sister who is trying to get her out. Oh, I love it! I love it. That's going to be amazing. Um, what what things are you taking? from your experience with rose gold and, uh, and, and using in this book, what, what things did you learn during this process that hopefully is making the second novel easier? Oh gosh. I feel like I'm still like, I'm so early in my apprenticeship that I probably can't appreciate all the lessons that I've already learned. But I guess one thing would be not to panic. If you have to toss an entire first draft, I, I didn't have to toss the entire first draft of my second book, but I got rid of around 60, 65% of it, but I think when you've done it before and you can see that it improves it and this is just part of the process, it really calms you down a bit and you're not thinking, well, uh, with mixed success, most days I'm telling myself, you're not a one-hit wonder, it will be fine, you can write another book, you've done this before. I think just having that confidence of, I, have, I can see a book in front of me that I've actually written so I know I can do it is reassuring. That's fantastic. Uh, the new book is called Darling Rose Gold. It's out available everywhere now in, in all formats, Kindle, uh, audiobook, hardcover. Out of him in um, one week's time. I'm, I'm telling people That's that amazing. now that a lot of people are self-quarantining, grab the audiobook. Give it a listen and, and uh, all the money that you're saving in gas from 
not going to work, uh, use that money when the bookstores open back to buy a hardcover for yourself. That's uh, a great way to, to do that. Um, uh, Stephanie, if people are just learning about you and want to dig into all the great stuff you do, is there a place they can connect with you online? Sure. So my website is stephanierobel.com, which is just spelled the same way as my name. And then I'm the most active on Instagram, and my handle there is also Stephanie Robel. Excellent. We'll uh, link all that up in the show notes of, the, of this episode. Uh, thank you, Stephanie, for taking time to come on the show today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This is so fun. Stay tuned now for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Fox's The Ember War. Near future. The probe slowed as the sun's heliosphere disrupted the graviton wave it rode in on from the abyss of deep space. Awakened by the sudden deceleration, the probe absorbed the electromagnetic spectrum utilized by its target species and assessed the technological sophistication of the sole sentient species on Earth. The probe adjusted its course to take it into the system's primary. If the humans couldn't survive, with its help, what was to come, then the probe would annihilate itself. There would be no trace of it for the enemy, and no chance of humanity's existence beyond the time it had until the enemy arrived. The probe analyzed filed patents, military expenditures, birth rates, mathematical advancement, and space exploration. The first assessment fell within the margin of error of survival and extinction for humanity. The probe's programming allowed for limited, autonomous decision-making, choice being a rare luxury for the probe's class of artificial intelligence. The probe found itself in a position to choose between ending its mission in the sun's fire and a mathematically improbable defense of humanity and the potential compromise of its much larger mission. Given the rare opportunity to make its own decision, the probe opted to dither. In the week it took to pass into Jupiter's orbit, the probe took in more data. It scoured the Internet for factors to add to the assessment, but the assessment remained the same. Unlikely, but possible. By the time it shot past Mars, the probe still hadn't made a decision. As the time to adjust course for Earth or continue into the sun approached, the probe conducted a final scan of cloud storage servers for any new information and found something interesting. While the new information made only a negligible impact on the assessment, the probe adjusted course to Earth. It hadn't traveled all this way for nothing. In the desert south of Phoenix, Arizona, it landed with no more fanfare than a slight thump and a few startled cows. Then it broke into the local cell network and made a call. Mark Ibarra awoke to his phone ringing at max volume, playing a pop ditty that he hated with vehemence. He rolled off the mattress that lay on the floor and crawled on his hands and knees to where his cell was recharging. His roommate, who paid the majority of their rent and got to sleep on an actual bed, grumbled and let off a slew of slurred insults. Mark reached his cell and slapped at it until the offending music ended. He blinked sleep from his eyes and tried to focus on the caller's name on the screen. The only people who'd call at this ungodly hour were his family in Bosque country, or maybe Jessica in his applied robotics course wanted a late-night study break. The name on the screen was Answer Me. He closed an eye and reread the name. It was way too early, or too late, depending on one's point of view, for this nonsense. He turned the ringer off and went back to bed. Sleep was about to claim him when the phone rang again, just as loudly as last time, but now with a disco anthem. Seriously? His roommate slurred. Mark declined the call and powered the phone off. He flopped back on his bed and curled into his blanket. To hell with my first class, he thought. Arizona State University had a lax attendance policy, 
one which he'd abused for nights like this. The cell erupted with big band music. Mark took his head out from beneath the covers and looked at his phone like it was a thing possessed. The phone vibrated so hard that it practically danced a jig on the floor, and the screen flashed Answer Me over and over again as music blared. Dude, said his roommate, now sitting up in his bed. Mark swiped the phone off the charging cord, and the music stopped. The caller's name undulated with a rainbow of colors, and an arrow appeared on the screen, pointing to the button he had to press to answer the call. When did I get this app? He thought. Mark sighed and left the bedroom, meandering into the hallway bathroom with the grace of a zombie. The battered mattress he slept on played hell with his back and left him stiff every morning. Dropping his boxers, he took a seat on the toilet and answered the call, determined to return this caller's civility with some interesting background noise. What? He murmured. Mark Ibarra, I need to see you. The voice was mechanical, asexual in its monotone. Do you have any friggin' idea what time it is? Wait, who the hell is this? You must come to me immediately. We must discuss the mathematical proof you have stored in document title This Can't Be Right. Dot doc. Mark shot to his feet. The boxers around his ankles tripped him up, and he stumbled out of the bathroom and fell against the wall. His elbow punched a hole in the drywall, and the cell clattered to the floor. He scooped the phone back up and struggled to breathe as a sudden asthma attack came over him. <laughs> how? How? He couldn't finish his question until he found his inhaler in the kitchen mere steps away in the tiny apartment. He took a deep breath from the inhaler and felt the tightness leave his lungs. That someone knew of his proof was impossible. He'd finished it earlier that night, and had encrypted it several times before loading it into a cloud file that shouldn't have been linked to him in any way. How do you know about that? he asked. You must come to me immediately. There is little time. Look at your screen the robotic voice said. His screen changed to a map program, displaying a pin in an open field just off the highway, connecting Phoenix to the suburb of Maricopa. Come. Now. Mark grabbed his keys. An hour later, his jeans ripped from scaling a barbed wire fence, Mark was surrounded by desert scrub. The blue of the morning rose behind him, where his beat-up Honda waited on the side of the highway. With his cell to it... Some things you write now, uh, do they differ in the writing process from, uh, from... Plants looked a lot like benign mesquite trees in the darkness. A Native American casino in the distance served as his north star, helping him keep his bearings. You're not out here, are you? I'm being punked, aren't I? He asked the mysterious caller. You are 9.26 meters to my east-southeast. Punk, decayed wood, used as tinder. Are you on fire? The caller said. Mark rolled his eyes. This wasn't the first time the caller had used the non-standard meanings of words during what passed as conversation between the two. Mark had tried to get the caller to explain how he knew about his theorem and why they had to meet in the middle of the desert. The caller had refused to say anything. He would only reiterate that Mark had to come quickly to see him, chiding him every time Mark deviated from the provided driving directions. If you're so close, why can't I see you? he asked. He took a few steps in what he thought was a northwesterly direction and squished into a cow patty.